Hello and welcome everybody. Today's topic, does the Caribbean need a new business model? So what we are going to do today is to yeah, continue a little bit um, topic-wise um, where we yeah, stopped or ended last week. And uh, yeah, we want to have a look at the current um, economic situation in the Caribbean, some of the problems um, that we might see there. And um, of course, we will also talk about potential solutions or how a sustainable and uh, yeah, future-proof long-term business model for the different Caribbean states could look like. But before we do that, um, yeah, I want to ask you to let me know if you can see and hear me loud and clear. Yeah, feel free to hit the like button and uh, yeah, say hello in the chat, just to make sure that you guys can see and hear me loud and clear. So what are we going to talk about today? We talk, we're going to talk about yeah, the tourism and banking sector, we're going to talk about remittances, we're talking, going to talk about inflation, we're going to talk about business process outsourcing and uh, many, many more. We're going to talk about potential solutions um, yeah, that we should have a look at. So um, yeah, why do I think it's important to talk about these things? Um, yeah, as I said, um, last week we talked a little bit about the current risks that um, yeah, a lot of Caribbean states um, are facing because of the global situation um, yeah, with the pandemic, with the current economic situation on the whole planet, in China, in the US, in Europe um, and so on. And of course the effects that that will have um, on yeah, a lot of Caribbean economies. So let's talk a little bit about the status quo, meaning um, yeah, what is the current situation in the Caribbean. And of course, um, yeah, if you have a question, make sure to drop it in the chat in the comment section. Um, yeah, use ask um, or the has hashtag ask um, yeah, so that I know that you have a specific question and then of course I will take the time to answer it. So um, yeah, what um, what is in my eyes one of the main um, problems right now in the Caribbean? Um, we have a lot, but uh, yeah, start with the most, uh, yeah, the most precious one. So when I um, yeah, look at the GDP development um, of a lot of Caribbean countries over the last you know, two years, um, especially 2020 and 2021. Um, what we see is that we um, yeah, see a contraction of the economies, um, no matter which Caribbean uh, state you're looking at, depending yeah, uh, which statistic you're looking at. We're talking about 5% um, decrease of GDP, um, sometimes up to 15%. And um, yeah, one of the main reasons, of course, for that, there are a lot of them, but one of the main reasons um, is that, as you know, most Caribbean countries are very reliant on the tourism sector. Um, and not only that, um, besides tourism, um, also a big part of the GDP is attributed to banking and finance services, but we will talk about that in a minute. And of course, um, yeah, over the last 18, 24 months, um, yeah, the to global tourism basically came to a hold and therefore, um, yeah, that impacted a lot of the Caribbean countries. For example, if we look at Jamaica, I think 25% of all jobs in Jamaica are directly or indirectly related to tourism. And I think 50% of the foreign um, influx of currency um, is attributed um, to tourism. So it's yeah, fair to say that tourism in general is a big factor when we talk about economic development uh, in the Caribbean right now. And of course, um, yeah, when we talk or when we see um, 
business owners um, or politicians uh, talking about the current situation. Um, yeah, we see a lot of people kind of praying that um, yeah, the global tourism gets back to normal. And to be honest, um, I have my doubts if that is actually going to happen anytime soon. Um, yeah, especially when we look at a lot of Caribbean states where we still have very strict um, regulations, where we still um, have curfews, where we have lockdowns, where we have no movement days. Um, I think it's um, yeah not really responsible um, to hope um, that the global tourism um, yeah, is going back to normal and therefore hoping for that um, influx of money. So that's basically problem number one that we have, that yeah, a lot of Caribbean countries are very reliant um, on the tourism sector. Um, reason number two, or current situation problem number two, is that, um, again, depending on which uh, state or which country you're looking at, um, remittances um, are a big part um, of the overall GDP of a lot of Caribbean countries, um, meaning the money that um, yeah, um, people or the diaspora overseas um, is sending or are sending back uh, to their home countries. And depending on the nation you're looking at, we're talking about 10, sometimes 20% of the overall GDP um, of a country in the Caribbean um, comes from remittances, meaning from, yeah, money that families sending back um, to their home state. So um, therefore, I think it's important to understand that everything that um, happens on a global scale um, also affects indirectly um, yeah, the Caribbean economy. For example, if people in the US, Canada, Europe, UK, maybe even Asia, China, um, do not make as much money as they did before. Therefore, they cannot send that much money back home. And then, uh, yeah, that money is missing in the, yeah, in the economic system um, of the Caribbean. So that's the second um, yeah, big problem or big, big dependency, to be more specific, um, that we are seeing right now. We're also seeing um, interest rates increasing um, all over the world. Um, last week, um, yeah, I already talked about that. And the question here is, of course, okay, is it more because um, of the supply chain um, issues that we're seeing all over the globe, um, meaning there's a shortage of goods in the system? Um, or is it more because of the limitation, uh, not the limitation, um, of the increase um, of uh, money in the monetary system? Um, yeah. The future will show um, which one is more um, yeah, responsible for the, the current development. But nonetheless, um, fact is, um, yeah, we have to pay more and more money for the same goods and services. And especially when we talk about Caribbean nations, um, which are yeah, often highly dependent from um, imports of goods. And um, if we then see that the local currencies um, are yeah, losing value compared to the US dollar, then of course that makes it more and more expensive um, for companies, for private persons to buy um, yeah, more goods and services and import them into the country. So yeah, um, overall, um, to, to wrap it up a little bit, I think if we look at the current status quo of most Caribbean countries, we see uh, high dependency on external factors, no matter if we talk about tourism, no matter if we talk about remittances that uh, flow back into the country, if we talk about inflation and so on. Um, a lot of these factors are outside of the control of um, yeah, the actual states or countries um, itself. Then I want to talk about um, yeah, another bottleneck um, that I'm seeing, um, and that is the banking and finance sector that I want to talk about for a minute. So when again, when we look at um, the GDP um, of most Caribbean countries, then we see that um, services, especially, especially financial services, um, attribute for a big chunk um, of the overall GDP. 
depending on the nation you're looking at, we're talking about 10%, um, sometimes even more than that. To give you um, yeah, a comparison, if we look at um, Europe, for example, um, financial services, banking services, usually attribute in the one digit um, area um, to the overall GDP, meaning we're talking about one, two, three, four, maybe 5% of the overall GDP um, is contributed to financial services. Um, on the other hand, I hope uh, or I think you probably can agree with me on that, is that when we then look um, at the financial services or banking services that are actually offered to the locals in the respective countries, um, they are often, yeah, how do I formulate that? So, yeah, mediocre or not on the level um, that they should be to yeah, encourage uh, trade payments and uh, yeah, to, to accelerate the economic growth uh, overall and make it easy to do business, um, not only locally, but especially when you're talking about cross-border payments. And um, yeah, therefore, I think uh, we also need to have a discussion about that or need to think about the question why on the one hand do so much Caribbean countries have such a big financial and banking sector when we look at the GDP but on the one other hand um, the actual services that they offer to the population um, yeah, are so mediocre and uh, subpar and uh, yeah the question is probably easy to answer because most of the well, not most, but a lot of the services um, are actually offered only to foreigners. Um, for example, yeah, I want to not talk too deep about that, but we, when we talk about names like uh, or types like subjects, rather like Panama Papers or more recently um, the Pandora Papers, we see um, yeah that these banks or small islands are often used to yeah hide money um, or even Whereas sometimes laundering money, uh, tax evasion, things of that nature from yeah, very wealthy people um, all over the globe. And therefore, I think um, we have to have an open conversation if that is actually a sustainable um, yeah, long-term business model to basically yeah, offer not shady, but questionable uh, financial services to the wealthy um, of the world. And on the other hand, um, yeah, offer subpar um, or yeah, not enough financial services um, to their own population. So I think um, yeah, that might be an important topic to think about. <clears throat> so Denise is asking. Um, what services would you say are mediocre? Um, in that case, I'm talking specifically about yeah, financial services, banking services, and so on. Um, I don't know which uh, country you are from uh, in the Caribbean, but um, yeah, when I look at, uh, let's say, the struggle you have to go to to even open a bank account, a lot of the amount of paperwork you have to um, do the amount of time it takes to actually just open a simple bank account, um, yeah, just uh, slows yeah, business down. Um, then, yeah, things like online banking, for example, um, yeah, are often not on the level uh, that you would um, expect, especially when you keep in mind that these are often uh, yeah, software um, issues, uh, meaning it wouldn't be so hard to implement or to program a solution that actually enables uh, at least local uh, yeah, online payments, uh, easier interfaces um, and so on. Um, but also things like uh, cross-border payments, for example, um, meaning a lot of Caribbean, especially Jamaican uh, companies, um, yeah, still have a lot of trouble to accept payments online. So the amount of hoops they have jumped through uh, to actually be able to accept the credit card payments on the website uh, and things of that nature just limits the ability to do business um, internationally. Services like Stripe or PayPal, for example, just don't work um, in the Caribbean or 
are often very limited um, in the functionality, so they are not um, yeah, a, real, a real solution for a lot of businesses. So therefore, um, yeah, at the end of the day, um, currency payments, cross-border payments, um, ease of use of online banking um, solutions and so on are just one of the vital factors when we're talking about doing business today in a more and more digital environment and in a more international environment, meaning especially when you offer services, um, it doesn't really matter who is buying your services. If you're programming an app, for example, your client can come from the US, uh, UK, China, you name it. Um, you can deliver your, your service, you can deliver your product, but um, you might have yeah, some troubles to actually get paid or yeah, it's very complicated um, to actually get paid or is, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, it's also very expensive, meaning you have to pay a lot of fees and so on. So um, yeah, that's what I mean when I say that uh, the services, especially in the financial sector, are uh, mediocre compared to, of course, a lot of the more developed uh, markets in the world. But um, I mean, it's specifically from the perspective that when we look at the GDP, um, that um, yeah, most of the financial services, or not the most, but a lot of big part of the financial services um, that contributes uh, to the GDP actually comes for services um, that are offered not necessarily to the local population, but uh, yeah, to, to international clients. Therefore, the local population doesn't really benefit uh, from that. So if you're from Jamaica, then um, yeah, you know the, the struggle um, you have to go to if you want to open a bank account. Yeah, if you want to use um, online banking, if you want to accept payments online um, and so on. So I hope uh, yeah, that answers your question. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk a little bit um, or yeah, let's maybe uh, talk also a little bit why I think that uh, tourism yeah, is, is such a big uh, problem, or not necessarily tourism, but um, if you look at Jamaica, for example, um, when I went the first time to Jamaica, I was kind of shocked that um, yeah, most of the beaches um, are not publicly um, accessible, meaning that they often um, belong to a hotel or a resort or that they are owned uh, or privately um, owned. Um, because yeah, basically every other country in the world I travel to, um, most of the, or the beaches um, are just public uh, property or public goods, meaning everybody can um, go there. Um, and what I realized is that the business model of a lot of Caribbean countries is basically to yeah, sell their real estate and literally to sell their beachfront property. And uh, we can talk about the tourism sector where they sell the beachfront property to big uh, yeah, hotel or tourism companies. They again often are owned um, by companies or individuals um, overseas, meaning all that money that is generated there besides the tax income yeah, is often uh, or flows often outside um, of the country. Often, yeah, when we talk about Jamaica, often back to Canada, yet the US, um, and so on. And at the end of the day, we're talking about states, um, island states, um, more often, that uh, yeah, have very limited land mass. So there is only that limited amount of beachfront property of real estate that you actually can sell or lease um, over time as a business model. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and not only that, so not only from a tourism perspective, also from a trade perspective, for example, again, let's look at Jamaica. Kingston Harbor, um, or Kingston is one of the biggest ports, one of the biggest natural harbors um, in the world. And uh, yeah, um, as a very good uh, strategic position um, in international trade and uh, yeah, could really become um, a trade hub, a shipping hub, um, supply chain hub uh, for yeah, a lot of trade that goes uh, yeah, through Europe, through North America uh, or to um, Africa. But um, 
a big part um, of the Kingston Harbor or um, you know, Kingston Port, I don't know how to say it correctly, um, is actually um, sold or leased um, to the Chinese. Meaning, um, yeah, the, even here um, we see that for the, maybe that's a little hard to say, but for the short term benefit of getting some money um, into the bank, um, a big asset has been sold. And I think that's what I'm seeing over and over again, that a lot of the most valuable assets, meaning uh, real estate, um, natural resources, um, trade uh, routes and so on, are sold um, or leased to foreign um, entities. That, of course, yeah, brings in uh, money on the short term. But from a long term perspective, again, at some point in time, you run out of uh, assets um, that you actually can sell. So I think, um, yeah, that's also not a really sustainable um, long-term solution. All right, so um, let's talk a little bit about um, yeah, the, the solutions or, or the potential solutions um, that might uh, help in that regard. And of course, um, yeah, share your thoughts, share your ideas and um, the offer um, or um, I want to offer again, if anybody wants to join the live stream, if anybody wants to join me um, and yeah, have a face to face conversation, um, feel free to do that. Um, you should see the link down below, meaning if you go to bit.ly and then slash Simon's live stream, you should be able to join the, uh, yeah, the green room backstage. And uh, then I will bring you on and uh, yeah, you can share your thoughts. You can share your ideas and then we can maybe have a conversation. So I will just keep the link here for a second. <clears throat> okay. So what do I think, um, what can be some solutions, um, or what can be some approaches? Um, that maybe, uh, if not eliminate completely, but uh, maybe yeah, lower some of the, the risks or, or downfalls that we are um, seeing right now. So, um, yeah, one thing that people are talking a lot um, right now or over the last years, especially yeah, when you talk about digital transformation, yeah, the more and more yeah, digital global economy is business process outsourcing. Um, again, I hear a lot of business people, a lot of politicians um, talking about that, that yeah, BPO, business process outsourcing, um, yeah, can help um, Jamaica or Caribbean countries in general to get more money into the country. And uh, generally speaking, I would agree with that, um, but I want to yeah, maybe talk a little bit more detailed about that uh, in a second. Good morning, Roderick. I pronounced it correctly, Roderick Jordan. I hope so. Glad to have you here. And uh, yeah, for everybody that um, is just joining, um, today's topic is um, yeah, or is the question: Does the Caribbean need a new business model? Um, yeah, and we kind of continue from last week's conversation where we talked about some of the current economic risks um, that we're facing globally, and more specifically um, in the Caribbean region, or how that can affect the Caribbean region. And uh, yeah, today I want to talk a little bit more specifically about the current situation in the Caribbean, um, if it's actually sustainable from a long-term perspective, and uh, yeah, what we maybe can do to um, yeah, develop a more sustainable long-term business model for um, yeah, the Caribbean in general and for the Caribbean island states. So yeah, if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, any ideas, um, feel free to drop them in the chat, in the comment, chat, comment section, and then I will try to answer them. Of course, leave a like um, if you enjoy the content, um, that always helps the show. And of course, if you haven't done so as yet, make sure to go to the YouTube channel subscribe there, hit the bell notification so that you get notified whenever I go live or whenever when we release a new video. And again, 
the offer is still valid um, if you want to join me and uh, yeah if you want to have a conversation about the current topic or if you have any question feel free to join me through uh, or join the live stream through the link that you can see in the, yeah, the video in the image below and uh, yeah then you will enter backstage in the green room and uh, yeah i will bring on and we can have a conversation all right, what was I talking about? Exactly, business process outsourcing. Um, it sounds to me that for a lot of uh, yeah, people, um, business process outsourcing is kind of a holy grail. Um, how uh, yeah, Jamaica or Caribbean states um, can kind of get more currency um, into the country. And on the one hand, first of all, I definitely um, would agree with that. Um, from the perspective that I think um, every Caribbean nation should think about, okay, what kind of services can we offer to the global market? And uh, that is where it's actually a demand for. And I think that is also, yeah, the, not the problem, but maybe the, yeah, well, maybe we can call it problem. Um, but one of the details we have to talk about, because I think it's very important to make sure that we talk about the right sort of business process outsourcing. Because at the end of the day, when I read about the companies or the services um, that um, yeah, are active in that area in the Caribbean right now, we often talk about very low level tasks like um, yeah, call centers for example, and so on. And uh, yeah, nothing against uh, call center agents, but um, in my eyes, that is basically a race to the bottom because um, yeah, there are just so many or so much um, English speaking nations um, in the world that um, yeah, that is a very, um, how do I say that? Um, the qualification is not very high, meaning everybody yeah, can do customer service um, if yeah, you speak English uh, with yeah, not so hard of an accent. Um, you should be able to yeah, be a customer service agent every, anywhere in the world, meaning the competition is just very high. So over the last, let's say, 10, 20 years, uh, we primarily um, have seen that a lot of companies are outsourcing their English speaking um, call center agents um, into or to India, for example, or to other countries where they have to pay very low salaries. And um, therefore, um, if now the Caribbean or Jamaica um, tries to enter these markets, um, then you also have to compete on a very low level um, when we're talking about uh, payments and so on. So I'm not so sure um, if that approach is the right one, of course, um, yeah, it can still um, create a lot of jobs for people that maybe are not so um, qualified. But what I think um, is more important is, um, let me just remove that. What I think is more important to focus on services, um, on BPO services that are actually on high demand, meaning things like um, programmers, meaning things like developers, data analysts, um, and so on. Um, I want to, or as a, as a general idea, um, I want to recommend to everybody to look at um, similar states, um, for example, Estonia or Singapore, um, which are also relatively small, um, relatively low population, um, not uh, much of natural um, resources um, that they can sell. And what these uh, nations basically do is exactly that. They focus on very um, yeah, high quality services that they're offering to the yeah, global market, meaning financial services, digital services, um, programming development services, and so on. And um, last but not least, also um, to create a kind of digital society or a digital um, ecosystem. For example, let's take um, Estonia, um, yeah, a company of the European, a company, a country of the European Union. Um, they already, or after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, um, they were in the yeah, 
precarious situation. Um, yeah, again, they didn't have a big um, economy, very small, very small population. And now the question is, okay, what is our business model? And they started early on to invest in uh, digital infrastructure and uh, in digital education and basically created a complete digital society and government, meaning you can open a bank account online, you can uh, open and register a business online, you can do uh, yeah, get a passport online, everything, all the paperwork, all the bureaucratic stuff that usually costs a lot of time and money, um, you can easily do that online. And that means just from basically every part um, of the world that you are in. And I think um, when we look at the Caribbean, something like that, um, yeah, should be should be the goal, meaning um, not just selling cheap labor in, in call centers, but make sure that the, the regulation, uh, that the regulatory environment um, is set up in a way that attracts uh, yeah, people that want to do business here, that the digital infrastructure um, is set up in a way that attracts investors, that attracts business. Um, and of course, um, yeah, also that uh, offers a high qualified, um, yeah, a high qualified workforce um, that's actually able to deliver services that are in demand in yeah, today's day and age. <laughs> All right, let me have a look at the questions. <laughs> okay, and I will take um, Roderick's question first, and then I will jump into yours, Denise. I think um, that makes the most sense. So Roderick is asking very valid points uh, regarding BPOs. Our main challenge, however, is that we are focused on job creation first. Yeah, I would definitely um, agree with here. I think uh, when we say, okay, the overall uh, goal should be um, to decrease the, the, in, the dependence on, on the tourism sector. Again, I think in Jamaica, it's 25% of the workforce um, is directly or indirectly um, tied to the tourism sector. Therefore, yeah, um, the tourism sector can have such a big impact on the overall economy or on the overall workforce. The first step um, should be to think about job creation. And of course, um, yeah, things uh, are very, uh, yeah, let's say low level task or low level jobs like call center, customer service and so on uh, can be a starting point. But again, I think um, we need to have a little more long term approach here and not that that short term thinking and uh, yeah, invest into the education um, of the workforce to make sure that we actually on the long term are offering services that are competitive, that cannot be um, yeah, get um, or that uh, the, the global market cannot that easily um, acquire elsewhere and that we are not competing um, yeah, just on price, meaning, hey, OK, uh, we are cheaper than India when it comes to uh, call center agents. Uh, that should not be the, the pitch. That shouldn't be the sales argument. But hey, we have a high qualified uh, workforce. We have high qualified uh, data analysts, programmer, AI, cryptocurrency, and so on, meaning technologies of the future. And I think the, the big or the great advantage, uh, let me phrase it like that, is that compared to a few years ago where it really yeah, wasn't really able to, to acquire these skills. Um, today, we have the opportunity, meaning there are even free, so much free resources out there. Free code camp, for example, or most um, of the big um, American universities, Harvard, MIT, and so on, all of them are offering free courses in data analytics and robotics in development in programming uh, in software development web development all these technologies um, that are in high demand right now that um, it wouldn't be even a big financial investment from uh, from the government that we have to build a completely new education sector and so on we literally can use a lot of the infrastructure that is already there um, to yeah, make sure that we mid and long term on the mid and long term perspective actually um, yeah, build um, jobs or create jobs that are competitive in the long run and not just, OK, we create jobs that um, yeah, are very quickly to create, but also that uh, or the risk is also that they become obsolete um, very quick. All right, let's 
jump into the question from Denise. What are your thoughts on cryptocurrency and Bitcoin as a source of payment for the Caribbean? A very good question. And I think um, yeah, over the last weeks and months, um, a very, yeah, uh, a lot of debates um, around that topic. Um, you know, we had the central bank or the Bank of Jamaica, um, yeah, minting their their uh, central bank digital currency. So I think it's a very hot topic right now. Um, generally speaking, I think. Um, or first of all, I would um, recommend you to um, yeah, check out the YouTube channel. I think we have at least two or three um, over two hour um, discussions and conversations exactly around these topics, meaning central bank digital currencies, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, um, and so on. Because yeah, it is not an, an easy uh, topic or there is no easy answer to these questions. So uh, yeah, make sure after this live, live stream um, to check that out. Um, yeah, with I have discussions or conversations there with people that are way more or bigger experts um, when it comes to blockchain and cryptocurrency that I am. Nonetheless, um, I think when we talk about blockchain as an underlying technology, um, I think that's a technology that will um, yeah revolutionize so much over the next 10, 50, whatever years that I think it's hard to um, to make predictions how that will actually look like a few years down the line. And I think um, it's at least yeah, probably equally impactful as the internet um, in general. Um, yeah, will will be will be blockchain over the next years. So um, when you're talking about um, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, Bitcoin, um, as a source of payment for the Caribbean, I think we need to really look at, okay, what are we talking about here? Um, because I think um, the, the major issue are cross-border payments, meaning, um, yeah, can I from Germany buy or pay easily for goods and services um, in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, for example, Denise, um, or vice versa. And uh, right now, that is a big uh, bottleneck. That's a big problem because most uh, yeah, cross-border payments basically go through um, a handful of big international banks and they are kind of the gatekeepers and yeah, charging high fees, fees making it uh, yeah, sometimes very complicated to actually do these um, or process these kind of payments. So I think it can be um, a technology um, that can really accelerate uh, the development um, in that area and can be very beneficial for a lot of uh, Caribbean countries because um, yeah, it make things, makes things more transparent. Um, it enables cross-border payments. Um, it's a decentralized system, at least when we talk about blockchain. And um, I personally think that it can yeah, revolution, revolutionize a lot of sectors, not only the payment sector, but uh, the same with real estate, voting, um, ownership, digital ownership, um, and so on. And I think we just see the beginning um, of a lot of developments um, that will unfold over the, na uh, over the next years. Um, I also want to encourage everybody um, to do your due diligence, to educate yourself when it comes to these topics. Because to be honest, um, yeah, there's a lot of, uh, well, I don't want to say scammers uh, or, or con men in the market, but um, there are a lot of bubbles. There are um, a lot of players that just want to make a quick buck. And um, yeah, a lot of people get maybe kind of uh, sucked into, into the void, into the rush of, yeah, uh, of making uh, quick money. And uh, yeah, of course, there's also then some kind of risk associated um, with that, meaning um, I think a lot of people right now using cryptocurrencies um, or Bitcoin, to be more specific, more as a speculative instrument, uh, same with N NFTs and so on, than um, a reliable payment system. But um, yeah, we see more and more um, companies that build on 
blockchain um, that yeah, try to build um, cross-border payment systems that um, have a blockchain basis. And therefore, I think uh, it can become um, a source of payment for the Caribbean. And I think um, yeah, every government, um, every bank um, should be their research and uh, development and put some money into their R&D departments uh, to make sure um, that they are at the forefront um, of these developments. Because I think especially small countries um, like most Caribbean island states uh, will benefit massively if uh, yeah, cross-border payments are cheaper, if they are faster and in general just easier, yeah, then that will yeah, encourage uh, more business and encourage more trade. And uh, at the end of the day, yeah, will increase the, the wealth for everybody involved. But again, um, it's for sure not uh, yeah, the perfect solution, but I think the underlying uh, technology blockchain uh, yeah is very promising which is why regulation is crucial um, yes and no let me explain on the one hand um, I would absolutely agree um, regulation is crucial um, in that way but more from the perspective that um, yeah governments or regulators need to make sure that we have the right infrastructure and the right regulation to use that kind of technology. But um, when we talk about uh, blockchain, meaning about decentralized systems, um, then the question becomes, OK, can we actually regulate these markets or that kind of technology? I want to remind um, you know, about uh, the live stream that we did, I think, two weeks ago with George Connolly, where we discussed um, the, the current situation with China banning Bitcoin or cryptocurrency uh, completely or not completely, they like cracking down over the last years more and more. But um, yeah, in that regard, China now uh, completely banned uh, all Bitcoin transactions and so on. And uh, although it's banned, um, people still doing it because it is a decentralized system. So there is nobody that really can uh, yeah, shut it down, that really can control it 100%. Um, but it will always be uh, yeah, controlled by a majority. And in my eyes, that is one of the, yeah, how do you say that, one of the um, big pros for um, for blockchain or for decentralized um, finance, that it cannot be shut down, that it's basically basically yeah, as democratic um, as it can be, and that you do not have one entity that is in power and uh, yeah, can shut it down or can overregulate it or whatever. So um, yeah, regulation um, is important. The question is, um, to what degree um, is it actually possible to regulate these things? And um, I want to encourage everybody to um, read the last um, publication or the last newsletter or take um, from Edward Snowden on um, central bank digital currencies. So we're not talking about blockchain or cryptocurrencies here, but CBDCs digital currencies and um, yeah, where he says, and I would agree with him, that um, that also um, contains a big risk because now we have a situation where basically the central, ba central bank, the government, one entity, uh, owns all the power, controls the complete monetary system and yeah, can shut down um, the system, can restrict uh, your ability to make payments, uh, to receive payments or even delete um, all your funds um, and uh, yeah I'm always get very nervous when uh, there's so much power concentrated um, in the hands of a few people so I think um, yeah it's a very interesting topic and um, I think we need to monitor it uh, very closely um, and I think every yeah every Caribbean government every Caribbean country um, should have yeah at least some research uh, or some focus done on that um, on that area because i think um, yeah if you do not have a digital or a blockchain or a payment strategy um, then uh, yeah you're probably going to be left behind over the next years <clears throat> uh, 
All right. So let me have a look on my notes. Um, what did I want to talk about or what we, what did we already talk about so far? Oh, okay. We have a long question or comment. Let me read that really quick from Bradley on LinkedIn. Bradley says, I feel like there needs to be a cultural shift amongst governments across the board. Innovation and technology should be at the forefront of all conversations. Children should be learning how to code and so on in schools. Very valid points around Estonia and Singapore. There is no reason why the Caribbean nations can't make that shift and provide services to the Americas. Yeah, I would 100% um, agree with you, especially when we think about um, the size of most Caribbean nations, um, which is most of the time a disadvantage, small islands, small population, um, yeah, small landmass. But in that regard, I think that's actually um, a very big advantage because compared to bigger countries, um, yeah, most Caribbean countries are at least can be very agile, meaning um, you can implement a lot of these changes very quick and very fast and really can turn around um, yeah, a society or a, an economy uh, over the, the span of a few years. For example, yeah, again, most of you guys know by now um, that uh, I'm German. So Germany has, I think, 83 million um, population right now. And uh, yeah, I live in a city where we have 100,000 um, living in a city and yeah, 300,000 in the, in, the, in the region, um, including the suburbs of the city, meaning that um, almost exceeds the population of most um, Caribbean countries. So um, what I want to say with that is that um, it should be not too hard um, to make the necessary changes. And uh, I think Bradley, um, you say it uh, correctly. I think there needs to be a cultural shift uh, amongst governments, uh, meaning to yeah, focus more on innovation, to focus more on technologies uh, or technology, um, and to really think about, okay, what are the necessary investments? What are the necessary regulations? Um, that we need to put in place to foster that, to, as you said, to equip uh, children with the right uh, knowledge base, teach them how to code and so on, and teach them really things um, that they can use in future jobs. And uh, when I look at most education systems uh, right now, and that is uh, for the complete Western world, not only for the Caribbean, um, basically our classrooms still look like they looked 100 or 150 years ago, right? People, children sitting in lines, then there's a teacher at the forefront, uh, yeah, at the chalkboard and, and teaching something. And um, yeah, that doesn't really reflect the requirements of the 21st century, meaning we have to make sure that we're actually teaching the, you know, the next generation um, the right things, and uh, that can be done quickly. Let me think about it. You can teach people in two, three, four, five years how to code. That is that is not such um, a big time span that we're talking about. The question is more: okay, how quickly do we actually get the right education systems, uh, the right curriculums, and so on in place? And how quickly can we um, make the necessary changes? Not so much. Um, yeah, how long does it actually take to, to learn these new skills? Yeah, exactly, Denise, as you said, curriculum in schools should adapt to the changing world. Um, I would, again, 100% um, agree with that. Um, yeah, I sometimes have to shake my head when I look at the things that um, people are learning in school nowadays. I mean, I don't know about you, but most people that are listening right now are probably over 20 years old. Um, when I think back at my um, school time, it was mostly um, remembering things. So you learn stuff, you remember it, then you have a test, and then you have to yeah, prove that you actually can 
uh, remember the information that you learned and uh, that was necessary um, 100 years ago or 10, 20, 30 years ago where uh, knowledge or information was either stored in a library or in a book or in a human brain. But um, nowadays, everybody has um, yeah, a smartphone, everybody has access to the internet, meaning we have access to the complete knowledge base um, of humanity and human history. Um, meaning there is no need for just learning things for the sake of uh, memorizing them. But um, yeah, Google can give you basically the answer of 90% um, of the questions um, that you might ask that are not context-based, but that are just information. You do not need, uh, yeah, for example, uh, I don't know, names of historic battles or whatever you yeah, got teach uh, in, in school, you can look this stuff up. But I think um, what is important uh, to teach the younger generation is how to think critically, how to learn how to use technology, how to use it in a yeah, beneficial way to be aware of the advantages and disadvantages and to um, actually yeah, equip the, the up and or the, the younger generation, the next generation with the tools that actually enables them to get a job in today's day and age or in the future. I think we do um, yeah, our, our youth at service if we teach them the same stuff that you and I learned in school. I'm not saying that we should uh, yeah, remove everything um, that we learned. I think there are some basics that are always uh, and always will be relevant and important. Things like uh, yeah, math, sp yeah, language, speaking, presentation, critical thinking and so on. But um, I think we need to make sure that um, the things that we're teaching uh, in schools um, are actually relevant to today's day and age. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if um, governments, if policymakers actually are fast enough and can keep up with, um, yeah, with the current developments. Because um, yeah, my father, for example, um, uh, worked in the, uh, works in the education field. Um, and he once told me it takes roughly 10, 15 years um, from the idea from the first discussion about changing a curriculum or implementing new um, yeah, new classes uh, till they are actually then taught in school because you have to first uh, yeah, find a consensus okay what is the new stuff that we're actually teaching then uh, and that takes a few years on a policy uh, on a governmental level um, then now you have to um, teach the teachers first. They need to be able to actually teach that uh, and be educated in the field. That takes another few years. And uh, then you need to implement that in the schools and universities. And now, yeah, 10, 15 years are gone. And um, as you know, today's world is just changing too fast. And uh, yeah, we need to find a solution that's actually able to, to keep up with these quick and, and fast changes. And um, yeah, with the pandemic, I think that forced um, a lot of the, or a big part of the education sector to rethink. I think when we look at a lot of the um, universities in the US, for example, I think they now have to rethink their value proposition. Because in the past, um, yeah, it was a lot of, okay, you have a big social life on the campus, you build a network here and the experience, the in-person experience um, at the university itself um, was one of the major selling points. And now all that, um, yeah, is gone. People learning um, online, people learning through Zoom calls, and now people um, asking, okay, why again do I pay so much fees for my education? Why do I pay 50,000 US dollars every year in, in student um, or university fees? Is that actually necessary? Is it actually required? Um, we're seeing yeah, a lot of co big companies, Apple, IBM, Google and so on, creating their own campuses, their own universities, where they teach um, people um, the necessary skills. And they are actually really at the forefront of technology and competing with the classic educational sector. 
And I think, um, yeah, if you are an 18 year old today, um, you have to make that decision, all right? Do I go to an online campus where I only pay a fraction of the cost and actually get uh, to learn stuff that is relevant and is basically a job guarantee of three years from now? Or um, do I go to an in-person university, uh, in-person campus where I have to pay a lot of uh, fees, where I maybe have to travel a lot, maybe even leave the country? And um, at the end of the day, learning stuff that is maybe already five years outdated. So, yeah, we will see how this is going to develop. But I think education sector is one <coughs> of the sectors where we will or we hopefully see um, more change over the next years. Give me one second. Roderick is asking, do you think agriculture is still a viable business for the Caribbean? With the technological, well, with the technological advances, both in production and tracking? Um, I think that is a very good question. Um, generally speaking, I think that agriculture is not a really long-term sustainable uh, business model for most Caribbean countries. There's just not uh, the landmass. And to be honest, uh, you cannot um, get the, the prices on the international markets um, that you need to yeah, be actually um, competitive. Then the Caribbean is a, in a region of the world where you have uh, on a regular basis um, yeah, natural, not catastrophes, but disasters. You have tropical storms, uh, you have droughts, you have, um, yeah, uh, uh, what is the name? When the earth is shaking, just earthquake, forgot the name for a second. Um, so all things that can uh, easily interrupt uh, or uh, yeah, devastate a, a harvest and therefore um, yeah, is also a very volatile um, business model. And um, I want to make everybody aware or maybe yeah, share a little story here. Um, or maybe, maybe let me ask you a question. Um, what would you say? Would you say that products are generally speaking more expensive in the Caribbean or services? So, do you pay more for products? Are they more expensive or services? And from my experience, I would definitely say that products are in general more expensive compared to, to other economies um, than services and that services are relatively cheap in the Caribbean. And um, that is, of course, uh, one of the main reasons is because the Caribbean has to basically import um, most of their goods um, that they are using, even agricultural goods, um, which then, of course, um, increases the prices. When we then look um, at, for example, the Americas or um, Europe, it's completely switched around the other way around, meaning products are way cheaper um, than services. Services um, are more expensive. For example, to give you um, an idea, um, when I was last time in Jamaica and you want to wash your car, depending where you go, um, that costs you probably something, let's say 10, US dollar, maybe 15, maybe 20, so something, something around that number. If you want to wash your, or not yourself, but if you want to get your car washed uh, in Germany, for example, um, and basically the same stuff done, you easily pay 150, 200 US dollar in a country like Germany or in Europe. So 10 or 20 times the amount um, that you actually pay in the Caribbean for the same service. And on the other hand, again, the products uh, are way cheaper because, um, yeah, when we talk about agriculture, um, yeah, there are just regions in the world. They are, on the one hand, um, from an environmental perspective, environmental perspective, way more stable, meaning they don't have to deal with all the environmental factors on the one hand. Um, and on the other hand, uh, yeah, maybe shorter supply lines, um, better infrastructure and so on, meaning they can produce um, agricultural products on a, yeah, on a 
for a way cheaper price. So um, I wouldn't really bet on that side. Um, although there might be one um, exception and um, yeah, when we, for example, talk about Jamaica, um, it depends on what kind of agricultural product um, we're talking about. For example, if we talk about the cannabis sector, um, which is a extremely fast growing market in the US, um, in Europe, um, globally, we're seeing more and more countries um, yeah, legalizing um, the use of cannabis in a recreational context, um, but also um, in a medical context. So the market um, is growing there or is, yeah, is uh, growing over time. And um, then we have um, Caribbean nations where we maybe have the right, um, on the one hand, uh, yeah, environmental um, factors, meaning we have enough sun and so on. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we could create the right regulatory environment to yeah, really produce uh, high quality products, maybe with a yeah, specific quality or specific brand name tied to it, and then export that um, into the global market. So um, if we look at very niche markets in the agricultural sector, I think there is some potential, um, for example, the cannabis market. Um, but I think when we're talking about normal agricultural products, um, I am not sure if the Caribbean is actually um, competitive enough um, in that regard. I agree with you regarding cost of products and so the ability to not use the forex to import would have a positive effect on our chase for US dollar income from tourism. Yeah, um, I agree with you here. I think, uh, again, I said it earlier on, I think tourism accounts for 50% um, in Jamaica um, of the, yeah, uh, of the currencies um, or US dollar currencies um, that flows into the country. And um, I don't know if uh, Caribbean countries are actually net exporter of uh, agricultural goods. As far as I know, um, that's not the case. Um, even agricultural goods have to be imported um, on a bigger scale. So um, yeah, I think, again, to, to answer the question, um, is agriculture a viable business for the Caribbean? Um, I don't know. I think um, it's not really something that I would bet on to, um, yeah, from an export standpoint, um, maybe we should um, yeah, develop it uh, in or so far that um, the Caribbean can supply itself and that it's uh, self-sustainable, that uh, the Caribbean doesn't have to import uh, that much of yeah, external goods in the or yeah, produce in that regard. And uh, if then we should uh, focus on yeah, very niche sectors uh, like maybe the, the cannabis industry or other products that cannot be uh, grown in other parts of the world because of legal regulations or uh, yeah, environmental factors. But um, on a bigger scale, I think the Caribbean is almost not able to compete with the US, with North America, with Europe, um, which are all um, yeah, regions that are producing their, their agricultural, their produce by themselves. Um, so yeah, we will see how this is going to play out. <clears throat> All right, so you already cracked the one hour mark. Um, if you're still with me, uh, do me one favor, hit the like button if you haven't done so as yet. Um, of course, feel free to share the video, feel free yeah, to share this content with everybody that you think um, could benefit from it. Um, I think yeah, the more open conversations we have about that, the more we can all learn. That's usually the best way how you can support the show. And if you're watching on LinkedIn right now, I would uh, yeah, encourage you to add over to the YouTube channel, subscribe there, hit the bell notification so that you actually get notified uh, yeah, 
when we go live or when we release um, new videos, you can find the YouTube channel. If you just type my name into the search bar, then you should be able to find it there. All right, let's recap really quick. And of course, feel free to add other questions to the queue if we haven't answered it or touched on it as yet. So um, again, why do I think that the Caribbean needs a new business model? Um, I think when we look at the GDP of most Caribbean countries, um, it is very dependent on the tourism sector. It often attributes yeah, of 10, 15, sometimes 20% of the overall GDP. And often um, yeah, a quarter or 25% of the workforce, of the jobs um, are directly or indirectly tied to the tourism sector. And uh, yeah, as you know, the tourism sector is very seasonal and generally speaking, very volatile. And um, yeah, it's also has the big problem that uh, you're basically selling your beachfront property, your yeah, assets with the, or your most valuable assets. And uh, again, no matter if you're selling beachfront property to big uh, hotel chains that are often owned by companies or individuals, individuals overseas, um, or if we're talking about um, yeah, things like ports or streets or yeah, infrastructure in general, um, that might give you an influx um, of short-term yeah, liquidity, short-term money, but um, yeah, you're selling your most valuable assets um, to foreign entities, and I'm not sure if that is actually sustainable long-term strategy. Then the second um, big sector or big problem um, that I see is that um, the banking or finance sector is attribu attributing so much to um, the GDP, again, something in the 10, 15 percent range, depending on the country. Um, but um, that these services are often only available for foreign entities or bigger organizations and that the local population, <coughs> sorry, smaller um, companies, smaller enterprises um, often do not have access um, yeah, to these kind of financial instruments. For example, simple things like the stock market, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically impossible for someone, for example, in Jamaica um, to buy any stocks outside um, the Jamaican stock exchange. So it's almost impossible for you to buy an Apple, to buy an EBM, to buy, I don't know, any other global company um, that you actually want to invest in and to diversify your risk, meaning to get access to the international stock and financial markets. So I think, um, yeah, that is a big, big problem that we're seeing right now. And I think um, that needs to be changed and that the banking and financial sector should be, yeah, I don't, don't wanna say restructured, but uh, changed in a way that it actually benefits the population, not foreign entities to yeah, hide their gray money or use it for tax evasion um, or other things of that nature. Um, yeah, remittances. Is that the right way to pronounce it, remittances? I don't know, meaning, yeah, money that family members are uh, sending back from overseas, um, again, attributing around 10% to um, the GDP um, or even more um, to a lot of Caribbean countries, which again, makes you very dependent on overseas or the global economy. Meaning even if you think, well, I don't have uh, anything to do with uh, the US or with the UK or Canada or Europe or China, um, whatever happens there will affect the economies there, will affect the ability um, of the people living there to earn money and then to send it back. And therefore, again, talking about a big dependency um, or a big dependency um, of factors that you're not able to control. Then we talked about yeah, business process outsourcing. Again, I think um, that is probably one of the main, or maybe one of the best um, short-term solutions that we can look at to yeah, create jobs, uh, to get more foreign currency um, into the countries. But I think we need to be 
aware or need to make sure that we are not uh, only focusing on, on yeah, low-level jobs on low-level tasks where we then um, yeah, have a race to the bottom salary and, and price-wise and where you're competing yeah, then with call centers or customer service agents in, uh, in India or other yeah, uh, cheap uh, labor countries. So I think when we're talking about business process outsourcing, we need to make sure that we really focus on high quality services that uh, not only are in demand right now, but will be in demand uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And then we're talking about coding, data analytics, AI, blockchain, coding, uh, yeah, developing software programming, web development, uh, and all of these things. And uh, yeah, not only on, on call center agents that might be replaced a few years down the line by AI and uh, yeah, speech recognition and, and text to speech. For example, if you uh, think back of the Google presentation a few years ago, I don't know, was it 2019? I'm not sure, where they um, did their demo of a phone call um, where somebody basically, I think, called a hairdresser or something um, and made an appointment. And that was completely done by a software, completely done by AI. And um, if you understand the implications of that technology, then you realize, OK, basically, every low level task, every business administration task, virtual assistant task um, and so on will be replaced um, by software, by technology, by AI in the next 10 years, which is on the one hand a good thing because then humans can focus on tasks that are really creating value and are not just um, yeah, very repetitive tasks. Um, but we need also be aware what that uh, has in what the implications of that uh, for the workforce or for the kind of business process outsourcing or services in general um, that we want to focus on or that we want to yeah, um, educate um, the, the upcoming or the next generation. Yeah, so these are my takes so far. Um, I think again, whenever we're thinking about these solutions. We should look at other regions of the world uh, where we have a similar situation and maybe think about, okay, what can we learn from them? Again, think about countries like Estonia in Europe or uh, Singapore in the um, yeah, Southeast Asia area, where we also have very small uh, states with very small land mass, no natural resources, um, yeah, small population. and uh, yeah, these countries uh, were able to create an economy um, or a very profitable economy with a yeah, high GDP per capita. And I think um, that should be kind of the, the vision for um, a lot of Caribbean countries to yeah, be the kind of digital hub, trade hub, maybe um, where yeah, other companies or global companies know, okay, if I want to get uh, good developers, if I want to get good at data analysts, if I want to get highly qualified and highly trained people that are yeah, versed in the digital realm, then um, I should look at the Caribbean. That's not where we are right now, but I think, um, at least in my perspective, um, that should be one of the main focus points um, when we look at yeah, a long-term and sustainable future business model for the Caribbean. And again, I think I want to encourage everybody to yeah, see it from a very positive um, or view it from a very positive lens um, because a lot of you guys probably think, oh, we are Caribbean, a small, very small population and uh, very small states. I would really see that um, as an advantage, really, com yeah, uh, as, a, as a very, if you compare it like you have uh, economies like the US or Europe or China, these are really big tankers that are very big, can carry a lot of weight, but are very heavy and very slow to steer and actually change directions. And then on the other hand, we have the Caribbean, with very small states, um, where we are very agile and can really change the direction very quick. Um, and I think that uh, yeah, should be the kind of positive note that I maybe want to end this live stream today. Um, yeah, 
with the technology that we have today, with the internet, with the digital infrastructure, and with the global demand uh, on certain type of jobs, um, I think it should be possible to yeah, change some of the economic focus of yeah, Caribbean states and really uh, yeah, have a digital first approach, focus on technology and uh, yeah, have an, always keep in mind, okay, not what do I need today, but what is the right decision for one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years down the line. All right, I hope that was helpful so far. I hope um, yeah, you have a great or had a great start into the day. Um, yeah, the week is almost done. We have Thursday today. Thursday is always kind of the day uh, yeah, where we yeah, where we have two different types of people. The one think, yay, the week is almost done. And the other group of people thinks, all right, now we get into afterburner mode and yeah, really um get uh, or shift into the next year and uh, make sure that we get the most out of the week so doesn't matter to which group you belong to i wish you all the best i hope that it was beneficial for you so far if you haven't done so as yet yeah leave a like leave a comment um, share your thoughts let me know what you think and of course um yeah leave your questions um, let me know what topics on future live streams or future conversations you want to see covered. And um, yeah, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel. That being said, I wish everybody a great day, a great week, and I hope to see you next Thursday. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Later. -bye.